You have David, let's get more serious here. <laughs> um, you're going to want to be in Matthew 24. That's where we'll be near the end of the service, uh, or the sermon, I should say. Um, <clears throat> this is a kind of a fun one because we're going to actually be able to take what we've learned over the course of the last couple of weeks. And when we look at this last little passage here today, the, the, the last example, we're going to be able to start to take everything we've learned thus far and really start to put it into play and watch how it all unfolds. You know, when, we, when, uh, when, when these were put together, they were put together in a very particular order on purpose because they build upon one another, right? You, you kind of want to know you know, that first one, so that when you get the second one, you can start putting them together. So when you get the third one, you start putting, they start, they build on one another, if that makes sense. Um, so again, we're talking about this key of David, right? Uh, we, we grabbed it from, uh, there's a couple places in scripture where we grab this idea from, but Revelation 3, 7, in that Philadelphia period, uh, we see that, 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 that they, what they had was this special thing that the Bible calls the key of David. And if you have the key of David, uh, he that openeth, no man can shut and shutteth and no man can openeth. In other words, the only person that can give you this key is the Lord himself. And those that, uh, uh, what we find out, uh, the reason why it's called the key of David, because it's opening up the treasures of the kingdom, if you will, and the kingdom being the kingdom of God, uh, being the word of God, and to open up that treasure, you have to have this key. And, and David is, is, was a very interesting guy because Ga David was a man that was after God's own heart. And in the Bible, uh, as much as we know that he was a man after God's own heart, it only says that David loved God twice. Now, certainly David loved God, but recorded in the book, it says it twice. What was it that he loved that was recorded all over the place? The word of God. So we start to put the puzzle together. Uh, again, what we're doing right now is we're comparing scripture with scripture. We're trying to find out what what it was about David that would, that would, that would give God the, the, the emphasis in his own book of all the words he could write to call it the key of David. And we know that what was the key to David's uh, relationship with God? It was his reverential attitude toward and passionate love for the word of God. And I hope, uh, listen, I know, and I can say this as, 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 as honestly as I can. I ain't perfect. I know there's a lot of things that I probably do that y'all are like, I can't believe that guy just did that. And, and I, 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 that's cool. Like, listen, that's the way it rolls. If you want to be the leader, you can step up at the plate. Thank you, brother. On Wednesday night, I like that. That was, that was the best message I've ever... No, I'm just joking. It was good, though. I was, I, was, I was very... And I was even thankful I was able to watch it. I actually got connection and was able to watch, and it didn't go out the whole time. I thought that was pretty cool. It literally it disconnected like maybe five minutes after you were done. I'm like, wow, that was pretty perfect. God wanted, wanted me to listen to that. Apparently, I needed to learn something from all that. So thank you. Uh, no, seriously. But listen, I know that. I get it. And, and listen, and, and you know, that's anybody in leadership. The leader is always the one you're going to point your finger at and say, you could have done that better. I could have done that. I could have done that better. I would have done it like this. I would have done this. Well, then you know what? Come up here and do it. <laughs> that's what I'll say. Uh, uh, in any leadership role, it's unfortunate. It's the way it is. Uh, but what I, what I will say, and what I want to what, what I want to get across to you, but but I hope that everybody in this room can say, but listen, but there's one thing I can say about Pastor Frank. He loves that book. He's in that book. He loves that book, and he loves to teach that book. And and by the way, that's really what you should want out of your pastor. Someone who loves this book that will teach this book and that will keep this book in the center of everything they say and do. And by the way. One that lives this book. And I hope, uh, you know, I'm, no, I'm not perfect like anybody else, but I, I can promise you this. I try my best to live uh, in accordance to this book. Uh, and, and, and I hope that you can at least say that about me. At least that. Try to say at least one nice thing about your pastor today. Let it be that. And I think, and honestly, I'd be okay with that. He loves the word of God. Amen. Okay. Uh, but we all should want this key of David. And so we started breaking down in the Bible uh, uh, the different keys that God very clearly lays out for us so that we can understand. Anytime you take a book, uh, any book, whether you, know, whether you go to a bookstore and you buy a book or whatever, you always obviously want to, you know, when, when you start to, to, to figure out if you're going to like this book or not, what do you do? You turn it over and you kind of see what that book's all about, right? To see if that book's anything that you'd be interested in. Well, 
uh, what we want to make sure we understand about all that and, and what is important about all that is, you know, this book's no different. What's interesting about this book is there's actually 66 of them in here. There's 66 books that compiled the Bible, and all 66 of them all are under one theme. And so we want to make sure we understand what the theme of the author is. And of course, the theme of the Bible is Christ's kingdom glory uh, or the day of the Lord. Listen, from, as a prophecy nut, right? I love prophecy. It's what led me to the Bible. It's what, what ultimately led to my salvation. Uh, listen, I can tell you this uh, with, 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 with all uh, positive, absolutely true statements. There is seven times more talked about in the Bible about Christ's kingdom glory in the day of the Lord than any, any other subject in all the Bible. Seven times more. What do you think's the priority uh, and the big circle on God's day? It's the day of the Lord when Jesus gets his glory on the throne of David. That is the theme of the Bible. So when you're reading your Bible, you've got to let that be the, 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 the theme of what's going on. And, 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 and again, I don't, I don't want to belabor the, the, the issue. I, I don't want to call out other churches. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to be real about this. The problem in many of our churches today is that Christ's kingdom glory in the day of the Lord is not the focus. They're the focus. And listen, we all got to be very careful. We can do the same thing. I, one Baptist church, yay, great. No, this is God's church. This is Jesus' church. Okay, this, is the, this pulpit's not Frank's pulpit. This is Jesus' pulpit. He gave me the privilege to stand up here and preach to y'all. Because if it wasn't for him, what would I be? Nothing. I'd be nothing. Listen, it's all about his glory. And if this church is never about his glory, then we've lost it. We, 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 we may as well pack it up and go home. Because then it becomes inward focused and we come all about ourselves and it's all about what we want, how we want it, when we want it. No, no, none of that is, 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 is anywhere even close to what the Bible teaches us. And again, we said until Christ's kingdom glory is a passion and theme of our lives, we will totally miss the point of the Bible. We will totally miss the point of our salvation and thus we will miss the very purpose of our existence. I.e. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21, Christ glory in the church forever and ever throughout all ages. Amen. amen. I love when God amens himself. Call today. Because that's what the purpose is. That is the purpose of the church. And there's no other purpose greater than that. So we want to establish the theme of the author. Okay? Not, uh, uh, the second one that we looked at last week, right? Uh, key number two. And that's right... Who spelled that? It was like that last Yeah. <laughs> There is definitely not two I's in rightly, so we need to change that. Uh, it's rightly dividing the word of truth spelled correctly. Uh, I did get my degree in bad places, so don't go there apparently. Uh, okay, so anyways, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, again, the key point, most false doctrine that is taught in the church today is actually doctrine cor that's correct, but incorrectly divided, pointing to the wrong people group i.e., can someone lose their salvation? Well, in the right dispensation, they, they kind of can, okay? Just not this dispensation. During this dispensation, something very unique is going on. The Holy Spirit, when it comes inside of you, it seals you until the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation. But there are certainly verses that, well, now a lot of minute now, and if you don't understand who it was written to, if you don't rightly divide the book, if you don't put it in its proper place, uh, you're going, you, 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 it's, it's right doctrine just for the wrong people. You know, most folks, one of the big, here's a big one right here, ready? This is why everybody's got the whole rapture thing all screwed up. They don't understand there's actually three raptures in the Bible. Which rapture are we talking about? See, you want to know why people think the church is in the tribulation? Because they got the wrong rapture. That's why. And I'm going to show you today uh, one of the key places that, that can really, uh, uh, people get really messed up on that. Okay? But again, these things are critically important. We have to understand. Give none offense, neither to the Jew. By the way, there was a Jewish rapture that already took place at the death of, of Christ on the cross. Did you all know that? They were the first fruits. 
because they were in Abraham's bosom and that God, Jesus had to go get them and take them and bring them up to, 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 to heaven now because the blood of Christ uh, uh, was shed. <laughs> huh? It was shed and now people could be saved and be in the presence of God. You see, the reason why they all had to go to Abraham's bosom uh, before, the, before Jesus died on the cross is because, because the blood hadn't uh, uh, been shed yet and so, so they couldn't go in the presence of God i.e. don't take the blood out of the message, <laughs> okay? It is very important that we understand that, okay? But that's the Jews, okay? The church of God's rapture is, I mean, it could happen before we're done here today. That's the one we're waiting for. It's imminent. It could happen at any moment, okay? Uh, watching what's going on in this world today, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Uh, anybody think we're getting better? Huh? Okay? Uh, okay, so that is going to happen uh, at any moment, and then there is the quote-unquote Gentile rapture, or uh, if you will, the tribulation rapture that's going to take place at the end of the tribulation period. So, what, and it's all, you know, and the way God describes this, if you just really dig into his word and start comparing scripture with scripture, it's the first fruits, the harvest, and the gleanings. It's almost like God wrote this book, because he did. And he knows exactly what he's doing. But you see, if you mess those up and you try to make, mix them up and give them to the wrong people, you can see where you think now the church is in the tribulation. That's what happens. And so that's why what we're talking about, uh, especially when it comes to rightly dividing the word of truth, is so important. Study to show thyself approved. Rightly dividing. Again, if the Bible's telling us to rightly divide, that must mean you can wrongly divide. Okay, so keep your focus on that. All the Bible's written for you, but not all the Bible's written to you. And we've got to make sure we understand that. Some of the key books we looked at last week was Matthew, James, and Hebrews. These books were written specifically to the Jews. Very important to understand that. Don't pull church doctrine out of those books unless you can go to church epistles and see the parallel that, that, that allows you to make that church doctrine at that point. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, again, we looked at the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. They are absolutely 100% not the same thing. Is God a place? Is heaven a place? Even in our English, we can go, wait a minute, they, they, obviously something's different there. Imagine in the Greek how much more different it is, because it is. And knowing that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that's within you, and the difference between the kingdom of heaven, which is a literal physical system, a, a, a kingdom where Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David, listen, that changes some scripture if you don't get that right. And you're going to run into a lot of problems. Can God, can God mix the two kingdoms? Of course he can. There was a time in eternity past when all the kingdoms were together. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdoms of, of this earth. You want to know why there was so much demonic activity going on at the time of Christ? Because the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven were coming back together again. That's why. And you start looking through scripture from that lens and you go, oh my gosh, that's what's going on. And you go, yeah, that's exactly what was going on. Do you want to know how come there's going to be so much demonic activity going on during the revelation? Because the kingdoms are coming together again. Hey, huh? How about that? How about we just look at this book and let God show us? And man, the things that will come out of. The last thing we looked at last week is the book of Acts. Don't look at Acts as a doctrinal treaties. You look at Acts as a transitional book. It takes us from the Old Testament to the New Testament. If you took out the book of Acts and you read Matthew and you jumped right to Romans, you'd be all confused as heck. You'd be like, what is going on? This makes no sense. What just happened? This is crazy. You know, because Romans is really the uh, salvation book. That, that is what the book's all about, especially the first nine, well, eight chapters. Paul's giving us a treaty on salvation, man. He's showing us doctrinal, a doctrinal understanding of it. Okay, if you don't understand what's going on in Acts, you'll pull salvation stuff out of Acts. And we know that that can be dangerous, right? We took looked at some of that last week. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to take a, a little deeper dive into that Acts chapter 2 passage uh, here uh, because it's, a good, uh, it's good for us to, 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 to see how we keep verses in their context. Okay, so today, uh, uh, putting verses in their proper context. That's key number three putting verses in their proper context. And the key verse that we want to look at here is 2 Peter 3, where Peter says this, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, 
also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. There are some things that Paul wrote. Hey, they're hard to be understood. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rust. They wrestle with it. They, they don't understand it. They don't get it. So they wrestle with it. As they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see, what Paul's trying to tell, or what Peter's trying to tell us here, is that uh, uh, he already recognized that the epistles of Paul as, as scripture, this is obviously a key point, and, and he puts them on the same authority as Old Testament scripture. And, and so that's the first thing we learn from this passage. But then the next thing we learn from this passage is that some of those things that Paul wrote they weren't very easily understood by them because some of that stuff was a mystery that's just getting revealed now. And there were things going on there that, that if you were just pulling Old Testament scripture, it was confusing. It was going to mess you all up. Well, Gentiles and, and, and Jews are going to be together and joint, joint heirs together. Well, what? That wasn't like that in the Old Testament, you see. So there were some things that were hard to be understood. Uh, the Jews, a, a lot of the Jews still thought that even after Jesus' death on the cross, that the law still applied. Hard to understand. No, the law actually got done away with, you see. And they just couldn't understand these things. And because they were unlearned and because they were unstable, what they did is they rest the scriptures. They wrestled with them. They take scripture out of context. They wrestle with them and get them to say what they wanted to say rather than say what it actually means. That's it? Just one person? Okay. The rest of you, catch up. Listen, this is important. It's very important that you do not go to the scripture and just because you don't understand it, you wrestle it to make it say what you want it to say. For God so loved the world. It does not say anything but for God so loved the world. Don't wrestle with that so you can be a Calvinist. No. What does it say? It says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen, there's a lot of that going on around today that honestly, it breaks my heart, number one. And number two, it, it becomes almost to the point where it's downright wrong. You're, you're going against God's word. Do not do that. Do not do that. That's a dangerous place to be. God takes his word very seriously. And until we start to recognize just how serious he takes it, we'll never take it that seriously. And there's the reality of it. Listen, we have to understand something here. We got to keep verses in their context. Don't put presuppositions or pre-ideas into it just because we don't understand it or because we're trying to uh, teach a particular viewpoint. You understand? We can't do that. Uh, right is right. Wrong is wrong. Truth is truth. It's either 100% true or it's wrong. Any mixture of wrong is a problem. We've got to understand that. And, and, and listen, uh, well, they're close. They almost got it. Do you think God almost got it? Huh? No. God did not almost get it. And God, who do you think almost got it? Satan did. And there's where we're, there's where we're lining up, and we got to make sure we understand this point. Key thought. Every cult in the world that uses the Bible, along with every false teaching in the world, is rooted in biblical truth that has been taken out of context. Going back to what we, see how they build on one another? Okay, listen. In other words, it's biblical truth that has been misplaced or misapplied. Just like the rightly dividing stuff. You see, where we're, see how these are building on one another? And so again, very important to understand. Uh, a key quote, a text without a context is a pretext. What is a pretext? Giving a reason or motive which cloaks the real reason, pretense, saying whatever you want it to say. That's a pretext. You're making the text say whatever you want it to say. No, if you don't, you got to get the context first so that you can make it say what it actually says. We want the original meaning of the author, not the original meaning of Frank Savaggio. Because you get the original meaning of Frank Savaggio, man, my paycheck's going to be fat by tomorrow. 
You see what I'm saying? By the way, you know that's what people do, right? This is why they're flying around in jets and doing what they're doing. Because they're, they're making the Bible say things that it didn't say. It's crazy to me what goes on in these last days. Key principle, number one. Key principle number one. Whenever reading a text, it is important to remember these principles. Number one, you want to remember who is the audience. Identifying the audience is crucial to keeping verses in their context. I mean, that, that would seem obvious to us, but it's not. I've seen so many people pull verses. Uh, let me give you one, okay? If my people, which are called by my name, y'all know the Second Chronicles verse right there? Listen, I'm not saying that, that that can't be applied to us in some way, shape, or form, I guess. But doctrinally speaking, who was that written to? That was written to the Jew. So when God doesn't do it here in America, whose fault is that? Well, I prayed about it, man. God said, if you call by my name, hey, man, this, this nation will get healed. Listen, every single person in the United States can call his name by tomorrow, and this nation doesn't need to get healed. God has no, he has no, he, he does not have to keep to that because that was not written to us. That was written to the Jew. We got to be very careful with stuff like that. It's all over the place where, they, where I see people pulling Old Testament uh, promises given to the Jew and try to apply it to themselves. Hence the reason why we can preach, you know, all this money grabbing stuff. You're, you're pulling promises that were given to the Jew because those promises are physical. The treasures of gold and silver and all that and the milk and honey, that was all given to the Jew. We've got to understand that we're spiritual, okay? Our treasures are a little bit different, okay? Our treasures are wrapped up in crowns that we cast at his feet one day. Okay? God never promised that we were going to be rich and famous here on this earth. Matter of fact, he promised to us that, 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 that we're going to suffer persecution. How do you jive with that there, Olstein? What, what's up with that, man? How are you getting... I'm telling you how you're getting it mixed up because you're pulling Old Testament stuff and you're applying it to you. That's how. Very, very important to keep things in their context. Who is this written to? Was it written to the Jew? Was it written to the Gentile? Or was it written to the church? 1 Corinthians 10.32 uh, gives us that uh, ability to look at. Again, we looked at uh, 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 James last week. Uh, I told you Matthew, James, and, and Hebrew. I mean, Hebrews, come on. It shouldn't take a genius to figure out who Hebrews was written to. We should be able to figure that one out pretty easily. The book is literally named Hebrews. I mean, come on, man. James, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes. I mean, who was that written to? pretty obvious that was written to the 12 tribes wasn't written to the church so why are we going to james to pull church doctrine be careful there is not that's not to say there isn't stuff in james that is not also applied to the church because paul wrote about it he did and we can see that very clearly okay but 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 let that be james matthew and hebrews boy those are tribulation books all day long you want to grab tribulation doctrine go for it because that's where they're, that's where they're going to fit. How about Obadiah? The vision of Obadiah. Thus say the Lord God concerning. I mean, who was it concerning? Edom. So who was it not concerning? Anybody else? <laughs> it was concerning Edom. It flat out says the books. There's books that do that. Hey, that's not for us. And by the way, uh, watch that. Hang on to that because I'm going to come back to that Obadiah verse in a little bit and show you how, you know, apply that. Listen, this is important. It really is because one of the biggest reasons why I, I want to make sure we understand the importance of context because as I've already kind of already laid out for you, what you don't want to do is steal doctrine given to the Jew and make it your own. Okay, we call that something. That's called replacement theology or covenant theology. It's when you, when you are teaching that God is done with Israel and the church has replaced Israel. And you say, oh, well, yeah, okay, well, I got that. We don't do that. Good, I'm glad we don't do that from this pulpit. But let me tell you something right now. 95% of churches and pastors this morning are doing that. And if you don't know how to identify it, 
If you don't see that and you don't grab onto what's going on, you're going to get taught replacement theology and pff, there you go. And let me just tell you something. I, I, I should have put the verse up there. I didn't. But if you go to Revelation, not once, but twice, God says, those that say there are Jews are what? It's blasphemy. It's a synagogue of Satan. I didn't say it. Jesus did. Revelation 2.9, I believe. And 3.9, maybe. Is that right? Something like that. Listen. I should have put one of them up there. My, my, my fault. It, 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 I promise you it's there. Go look. Listen. If you try to teach that you are a Jew when you are not, it is the synagogue of Satan. Jesus said that. So do you think then, okay, I, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just asking a question. I'm asking a question. Just hear me out for a second. Do you think that if we are going to teach things like tongues and, and, and healing and, and all the faith, listen, if that was for the Jew and we're teaching it as for us, I'm just asking if it is, Let's just say if for a second. If it is, if that was given to the Jew and we're teaching it for ourselves, I'm just asking, is that the synagogue of Satan? Is that what Jesus said? Because that's what he said. So we need to make sure we get that thing right. Let's not get that thing wrong. Because if we get that thing wrong, we're in the synagogue of Satan. That's serious business. That I don't think people in the church take as serious business in these last days. Number one, probably because they don't even know that it's serious business. Because they just think that a church is a church and anybody teaching out of this Bible has got to be good, right? No, 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 no. Just because they're teaching out of this Bible does not mean it has to be good. They could be wrongly dividing. And if they're wrongly dividing, that's not good at all. That's bad. They are ashamed and that's not good. We want to know why the church is where we are today. Let me tell you why we are where we are today. Because we've had a lot of false teachers, that's why. That's why. And now... You can just pull up Facebook and you can get some false theology real easy. I've seen it all over the place to the point where I can't even look at Facebook hardly anymore. It drives me nuts because I get mad. I'm like, that's wrong. That is totally wrong, man. I can't believe anybody would even post that. That's wrong and they don't even understand why. And then you try to tell them it's wrong and, you know, you're the idiot. Okay, I'm the idiot. I just gave you 10 verses. You gave me nothing. I'm the idiot. I got gotcha. you. Beautiful. I'm a little, I get a little bent out of shape about stuff like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, but listen, it's important that we understand who it was written to, okay? The n principle number two, obviously, is the whole point of what we're talking about here, right? It's you got to make sure you understand the content, the context of what it's in. Biblical context is determined by keeping the specific verse being examined and interpreted within the context that has been revealed within the content of the whole book of the Bible, which is located. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, People do it all the time. They pull a verse. They read you the verse. Hey, look what that says. Hey, that's great. Did you read the context of the whole passage? Oh, yeah. Because if you read the context of the whole passage, you'll see that what you just said is absolutely wrong. Huh? It happens all the time. Here's one I'll give you right now that you all know. They all, we all, we might have even said it. Judge not lest you be judged. That's great. First of all, when somebody says that to you, ask them where it is in the Bible because 99% of the time they don't even know where it is. Good. I'm glad you know. But most people don't know. They're just quoting what somebody else said to get you off their back. Okay. The problem is go read what the passage actually says. Is that what Jesus is actually saying? No. Righteous judgment is perfectly fine. Don't judge based on your own opinion. I got you there. Give, let me give you an example here. I'm just trying to be that guy that gives examples. The, the idea of homosexuality. Judge not lest you be judged. You should have no right to judge anybody. You're right. I don't have it. But God did. Right. Romans chapter 1. Pretty clear. Where else you want me to go? Deuteronomy? You want me to go there? I mean, where else you want me to go? I can show you at least 10 places in the Bible where God said that homosexuality is wrong. Why are you judging me? I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the judge said. Do what you want your call. We're all sinners. We all got our problems. I'm just telling you, he called that one a particular one. He called it an abomination to the point where he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for it. He might not be happy with it. 
You want to go have a ball with that and, and let your friends all do it? Have a ball. I'm just telling you, God's against it. You couldn't show me a verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world, he loved everybody. Jesus is a friend of sinners. You're right, he is, but he doesn't love the sin. You okay? You understand? We get, what did I say, something stupid? Why are y'all laughing at me? All right, people, who, I'm getting laughed at over here. Y'all get my point, okay? Content is important. Key understanding. Bible. Why, when you're reading a passage, when you're trying to get a, a scripture down, why is this book in the Bible? That's your first thing you want to understand. Then you want to understand the book. What is the key teaching of that particular book? Then the chapter, what is the context of the chapter? Passage, what is the content of the entire passage? First, what does the verse teach in its context? If you can follow those orders, and, and listen, some of this will become second nature real fast once you grab onto it, right? Bible, book, that should become really easy and quick to you once you understand. You know, now, for example, the next time you're reading in the book of Matthew, you should be able to go, oh, this book's in the Bible to prove that Jesus is the king. That should just become second nature now, right? But what is the key teaching of this book? That Jesus is the king, <laughs> okay? And then you can start flow, flowing down from there. They'll just become second nature to you. But you've got to make sure you're reading from that point of view so that you can start to understand what's going on there. Does that make sense? It really should be done that way. We do it with everything else. Why won't we do it with the Bible? It makes no sense to me. For some reason, we do not like to take the Bible literally. For some reason, we don't. We'll take everything else literally, but we won't take the Bible. See, because when you take the Bible literally, it means what it says, and it says what it means, you see. You see, but when you don't do that, uh, well, now you got yourself a problem. You know, all you people who teach that, that, that pastors shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, that, that women, women can be pastors. Come on, that was written for back then. Well, that's not what it says. So who am I to go, that was written for back then? Uh, no. Did God ever say that it's okay for women to be pastors today? Where's that verse? Until you show me that verse, then you know what? <laughs> Sorry. Because Jesus Christ died back then, but that still applies today. Last time I checked. Some of the stupidest things I hear people say. See, they, they wrestle it. They like it to fix what they want it to say. N not realizing that what they just said, well, wait a minute, then that should apply with a uh, hundred other verses that you are okay with. How come it doesn't apply with those, but it just applies to the one that you're okay with? See what happens? Don't do that. Don't do that. Really don't do that. Again, I say, do don't do that. Thank you, thank you. Somebody was listening. I said it three times. I thought y'all would catch up, but you didn't. Look, Acts chapter 2, right? Uh, again, we're not gonna, we, we looked at some of these last week, but, but again, I just want to show you again uh, as we look at this, this, keeping things in context, right? Uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, right? P Peter says uh, uh, to them, uh, verse number 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, so there you go, man. No question about it. That if you want to be saved, if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, you need to be baptized. You need to go dunk yourself in some water to be saved. Listen, this is a big teaching in the church today. There's whole movements that teach it. And that's their verse right there, man. They'll bring you right there and they'll say, hey. And listen, if you're unlearned, <laughs> that's what it says. I must be, have to be baptized to be saved. Okay, the problem is, like I just said, don't pull verses out of their context. Okay? The book of Acts, right? We, we, we talked about this a little bit last week, right? Why is the book of Acts in the Bible? Because it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's Acts that the Apostles did while there was a transition going on from Old Testament theology to New Testament theology. It picks up right when Jesus ascended into heaven. We're in a transition right now. So Acts is not a doctrinal statement of church theology. If you think it is, you're going to have a lot of contradictions. You're going to have to try to figure out what the answer is to. And by the way, there is no answers, right? But it's a historical account of the Acts of the Apostles. The book. What is the real teaching or purpose of the book? To help make key transitions of the unfolding of God's plan. I showed you, I believe last week, there were seven key transitions going on. 
okay? All that stuff is important. Chapter, chap Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, you know what? Stay in Matthew. Let's go there. I probably should have just had you go there. My, my fault. Acts chapter 2. We were there last week, so it should be easy to find. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. Again, I said this last week. We're going to say it again, okay? Uh, what is the context of the chapter? It is the day of Pentecost. By the way, just for fun, it's the day of Pentecost. Who's that for? It's one of the seven feasts of Israel. Why in the world does anybody in their right mind go to Acts chapter 2 and go, oh, that's church doctrine? No, it's not. It's the day of Pentecost. It's, the, it's one of the seven feasts of Israel. That's not for us. Why would you think that's for us? Wrong divisions. That's why. That is a form of replacement theology. I'm sorry, but it is. You're pulling something, making it your own when it has nothing to do with you. Nothing at all. By the way, those seven feasts of the Lord, those are, a, those are fun within themselves. Because they're all prophetic, but they're all pointing to things that happened to Israel, not to the church. Well, that's when the church started. Uh, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. I don't know. But the last time I checked, the church started with the Jews. And then the Gentiles got grafted in. The, Ge the Gentiles were not grafted in as of yet. They didn't get grafted in until Acts chapter 10. Does anybody think that might be important? Because it, it, it probably is, because it is. Yet, we'll jump into these books, these chapters, and we'll just start pulling stuff for the church. Yay! That's why we're supposed to be speaking in tongues. That's why we need to get baptized in water to be saved. That's why you, we got the heat, gifts of healing. We got all this stuff, Benny Hinn. Knock you over, bro. Yeah, knock you over, bro. That's the workings of Satan. That's what that is. Because it's stealing somebody else's mail and trying to make it your own. Who would want to do that? We've got to be very careful with this stuff. It's important because if you don't think that Satan's not trying to mimic God, you've missed it. you missed it. That's exactly what he's doing. And we've got to be very careful with all this stuff. Peter is preaching to who? Peter was the apostle to the circumcision. That's the Jews, my friends. He's preaching to Jews. There's not a Gentile in this bunch unless it was a proselyte. Somebody who had followed, is now following the Jewish religion. They are in Jerusalem. They're in Israel. He's preaching to the Jews. It's Peter, the apostle to the Jews. And he's preaching a very specific message. That is the context of the chapter. It's the day of Pentecost. Notice the audience. We looked at this last week, verse 5. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews. Y'all see that right there? Huh? How about verse 14? But Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of... Okay, y'all see this right here? How about verse 22? Ye men of... Okay. Keep, you know, just keep doing it. By the way, you can keep doing it in chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, even into chapter 6 and chapter 7. The preaching is to the Jews. Why? Because what's going on? Because there's a transition taking place where God is offering the kingdom of heaven to the Jew one last time. Because they had already uh, uh, rejected the father by killing John the Baptist. Then they rejected the son. But who was it? You don't, don't reject the Holy Ghost. You reject the Holy Ghost. That's blasphemy. Right? They hadn't rejected the Holy Ghost yet. Because, by the way, the Holy Ghost wasn't even on the scene yet to reject. You understand? Now he's on the scene. He's starting to work. This is all transitional stuff, man. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is working in and through this, but don't, 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 don't try to pull doctrine out of this because none of it's happening yet. Paul hadn't been given the, 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 the information that he needed to be given that was going to be shared until Acts chapter 9. Okay? Is everybody with me? That, does anybody think that might be important? Yet I don't hear anybody saying that stuff when they say, we need to get back to the Acts chapter 2 church. Do you realize how bad it is to say something like that? No, we need to get back to the Ephesus church. Because we've lost our first love. I'll give you that. 
We do not need to get back to the Acts chapter 2 church because there's not a Gentile on the bunch. This is to the Jews. And the whole point of this passage, okay, uh, the, listen, you got to understand something. Man, I can't believe it's already 1149. My gosh, I'm only on page two and I got five pages. This is not good. I got to go. Uh, listen, do you understand something? What'd you say? Thank you, sir. <laughs> you must not have to mow the lawn today. <laughs> not on Sunday. There you go, brother. There you go. Listen, do, do you understand something? The reason why God gave the gifts to the apostles, okay? The gift of tongues. First of all, make sure we even understand what the gift of tongues actually is. Most people don't even understand what the gift of tongues is. It's not a gibberish language that somebody just made up that were the tongues of angels. That is not what tongues is. Tongues is an identifiable language on planet Earth that the apostles, they were just getting ready to go take the message out to the whole world. If, I, if, if I'm an apostle that lives in, 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 in uh, Greece, uh, or, I mean, I'm sorry, not Greece, uh, uh, J Jerusalem, and I, I go over to Greece and over there in Macedonia and they're speaking speech in another language, how am I going to get them to understand what I'm saying? That's what the gift of tongues was. That now they could speak in their language so they could understand them. Every time you see the word tongues, that's what it is in the Bible. Yet somehow, some way, we got into this gibberish stuff that nobody understands. That makes no sense. Who, where did that come from? Huh? Listen, let me tell you why the gift of tongues and the gift of healing and all that stuff was giving. And by the way, those gifts were the gifts of the apostles. They, it flat out says it. I don't understand how people teach that they're apostles today. The Bible gives you the exact criteria of an apostle in Acts chapter 1. Do you want to know what it is? They had to have seen the risen Christ and walked with them. If you're an apostle today, you've been alive for 2,000 years, man. Hallelujah to you, man. I don't know how you did it. See, we go against Scripture to fulfill our own little ideas. And this is what happened. By the way, all the apostles, let me repeat that, all of them were, there's not one Gentile apostle in the whole Bible. How about that? Yet somehow, some way, we took what was given to the Jew and we made it ours. That's replacement theology. And all I'm saying is, until you can prove me wrong on that, you better, and using the Bible to do so, that's the synagogue of Satan. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Jesus said it. So what are you going to do with that? Listen, do you understand? When the book of Acts was written, was being written by Luke, was Romans written? Was Corinthians written? Ephesians? Was any of the books after that written? No. So how are you going to convince a Jew that what I'm, because I'm about to change your whole world, buddy. We're about to turn your world upside down because you're living in Old Testament theology. We're going to go to New Testament theology. I, you're, we're about to change your world upside down, Jew. How were they going to convince the Jews that what they were saying was actually from God? Now you understand what the gifts of the apostles were. That's how. Because the Jews required a, oh, boom, there you go. There are no, we don't require a sign. We require, and once all the rest of the New Testament was written, guess what? I can just go to the Bible now and get the knowledge I need. I'm telling you guys, something's wrong going on in this world today. Something's wrong in the church, and people aren't privy enough to it. And there's some well-meaning people. I'm not saying they're not well-meaning. They're just sincerely wrong. Listen, man, all I know is those Muslims that flew those, tr those planes into our buildings, they were well-meaning. To their own theology, they were well-meaning. They thought they were going to go with Allah and be with the, the 70 versions and all that stuff. I don't even know why you want 70 versions. I can't deal with one. Y'all get my point? Uh, obviously, she's not. I got two kids, so that can't be. But y'all get my point? Oh, listen, this is crazy, but they really believed that. When they took those planes and they flew them in there, and when they walk in with their bombs strapped around them, they believe that what they're saying is true. They're just sincerely wrong. You can be sincerely wrong. And listen, that's part of our responsibility as Christians. Admit when you're wrong and get it right. Why is that so bad? Why do we got to be so upset about that? 
Just, hey, man, I'm wrong. That's what scripture says. That's okay. Get right. I promise you this God ain't going to be upset at that. God will be like, hey. See, because before pride comes a fall and then comes destruction. But if you humble yourself, what does God do? Huh? Just humble yourself and admit you're wrong and get it right. It's okay. I'm not saying that I haven't been wrong. Just get right with God. Get right with his word. And God will exalt you through that. Listen, this passage, no doubt, has to do with the fact that the Jews had crucified their Messiah. That's what it's about. Verse number 37 makes that very clear. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, unto the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Is that what it says? No. It's not the same question asked to the Philippian jailer who was asked to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Those are two different passages to two different people. You want to know what you need to do to be saved? Go look at Acts 16. You want to know what you do when you rejected the Messiah? Go to Acts chapter 2 if you're a Jew. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin, which is the key to let us know what baptism he's talking about. Because when you compare scripture with scripture and put things in their context, what baptism is he talking about? John's baptism. John's baptism was to who? Who was he baptizing in Jordan? Was he baptizing in the, Jew, the, the, the Gentiles? No. Do you, does anybody beside me think this is important? <laughs> if we're going to get it right, we got to understand what's going on here, okay? He was clearly, clearly talking about uh, a different... Ba- now, now, do we need to be baptized to be saved? Yes. Just not with water. No, you're not. That so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death. That like as Christ... Does that sound like baptism in water? Or does that sound like baptism of the Holy Ghost in a spiritual sense? You want to know why? By the way, being baptized in water for salvation, okay, that would be literal, correct? I'm literally getting wet. See the, why you got to know the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? See, the kingdom of heaven being baptized in physical water for the remission of sin, John's baptism. Now that makes a whole lot of sense why the Jew would have to do that. Why would I have to do that? I'm the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is in me. Y- y'all get it? See, once you grab onto it and start understanding and seeing it, then you go, what? light bulb goes on. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is obvious. This is exactly what's going on here. Clearly, uh, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. By the way, there's three baptisms right in that verse. There's seven of them in the Bible. There's three of them right there. Do you know when you get baptized with fire? That's a judgment. That's a judgment, man. Okay? What does the word baptize mean? It means submersion. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to be submersed in water. You could be submersed in the Holy Ghost. You could be submersed in, wa- in, in, in fire. You could be submersed. By the way, submersion is what? Well, let's, let's, let's just sprinkle babies. That's not a baptism. What is that? Where do you find that in the Bible? That's not a baptism. The word baptize means submerged. Let's move on before we make some people mad that are listening. Okay, uh, again, uh, what does the verse actually teach in context? Okay, uh, Galatians chapter 5 is the next place we want to go to. Galatians chapter 5, if you want to run over there real quick. Galatians 5. Check it out, right? Uh, you get down there to verse number 4, and it says this. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So there you go, man. You can lose your salvation. People use this verse to teach that. And if you don't know how to... That's in a church epistle, by the way. You don't know how to answer it and put it in its proper context. Well, what are you going to say? Huh? What what, what are you going to say? Well, man, I guess if somebody thinks they're justified by the law, they're falling from grace. They lost their salvation. 
well, hold on a second now. Let's, let's, let's take a look at this now. Let's get into this. Why is this book, uh, Galatians, in the Bible? To teach the fact that Gentiles are free from the law, which is what Judaism was trying to teach them. That's what the book of Galatians is all about. He's really hammering. I mean, just go read chapter number three and you'll see that he's hammering that point over and over and over again, Paul does, right? Acts 15, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Galatians 2, I do not frustrate the grace of God, Paul writes, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I'm just trying to show you where the teaching started to come in and where Paul negates it. And right, it's right around Acts 15, 16 in that area is when Paul was in Galatia and wrote the book. Do you understand what's going on now? Okay, this is the point of the book. Obviously, it might be important to know that. It's not a book to teach us how to be saved. The book of Romans does that. It is a book to teach saved people how to be spiritual. That's what it's about. And if you get that wrong, you're going to run into, you're going to run into trouble, trouble. Chapter. What's the context of the chapter? It teaches us to walk in the spirit. Verse 16, verse 25. Paul understood that there is a priority that must be set into action before you can walk. And that is you must first learn to stand. Hence the reason why, when you go back to chapter number five, verse number one, he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liter liberty wherewith uh, you have Christ, right? So the problem the Galatians had was that they, couldn't, they could do neither. They couldn't walk because they hadn't learned to stand yet. Does that make sense? Because they had, come on, use the word. What, what does it say? What, oh, let me go back to the word. What had they done? Walk, stand. What, what, what word in there would go, jive with that? Thank you. What? They had fallen. They didn't learn how to stand back up and walk. There's the problem. Does that have anything to do with salvation? No, nothing. Nothing to do with salvation. So therefore, that verse, in its proper context, read in its proper context, has nothing to do with salvation. Why did we insert salvation into the verse? It had nothing to do with it. You see why this stuff's important? You pull verses out of context, people do it all the time. And if all you did is read that verse, you'd go, well, yeah, man, I see what you're saying. Well, hold on a minute now. What's the context of the chapter? Let's read the verses around it and let's see what's going on here. Because the word fault, this has nothing to do with salvation. Does anybody think that might be important? Huh? Listen, what Paul's trying to tell us is get up. Stand. Stand up. Okay? The law brought them into bondage and caused them to fall down. So Paul says, get yourself off the ground, stand up, and walk in the Spirit. That's what he's trying to tell us. Okay? And if we don't grab onto that, man, we will miss the entire purpose of the passage and we'll run ourselves into, tr into trouble. Okay. Uh, it's 12.02 already. So let's, we're going to skip Hebrews t uh, uh, 6 and we're going to go right to Matthew 24 because I think this one really gives us a beautiful picture of what we're trying to do here. And so let's just do this and we'll, we'll be done. Final example. If you ever talk to somebody who says that you can lose your salvation, I promise you, this will be one of the verses they bring you to. Okay? If you want to talk about eternal security, if you want to talk about, and they want to teach you, oh, you can lose your salvation, bro. I'm sorry, man. Here, let me show you. What does that say? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay. Which means, in the, if I just looked at that verse right there and I didn't pay attention to anything else, and I just read that verse, for me to be saved, I need to... Okay, so what if I don't endure to the end? See why you can lose your salvation now? And this is what they'll teach you. It is a heavy teaching in a lot of churches. I'm telling you, okay? Okay, but here's the problem. We've got to employ everything we've learned over the course of the last three weeks and start looking at this in its proper context, rightly dividing it, understanding what the theme of the book is to help us grab onto what's really going on here. So Matthew 24, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So now get it. Jesus was in the temple. 
Every word matters, my friends. There's a reason why I'm telling you. If I'm making a point, stay with me. I'm telling you it for, on purpose. Where was Jesus? He was in the temple. Before he now talks about what he's going to talk about here in the rest of this chapter, he departs from the temple. Everybody see that? Very clear, right? That's exactly what it says. Okay. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus uh, said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon the other that shall not be thrown down. Okay, so where, we're going to find out in verse 3. When they departed from the temple, they went up the Mount of Olives. And they're standing up at the top of the Mount of Olives. And if you've ever seen the Mount of Olives, you've ever been there, you know that you see the temple's right there. It's a, well, the temple's not. The, the, the zone of the rock's right there right now. But, but it's right there for everybody to see. So back in, in, in 32 AD, uh, Jesus is, is up there with it. And he looks at it and he says, you see that temple right there? That temple, not one stone, it's going to get torn down. By the way, it did, right, in 70 AD, okay? He said, listen, that's what's going to happen, all right? And look what the disciples asked him. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Listen, I'm not a smart guy. I might be a little off on a lot of things, and I might be a little goofy, but that's a pretty serious question right there, that I might want Jesus answered them. What? When will be the end of the world? Hey, if you want to know when will be the end of the world, let's not listen to all those morons out there. How about we just go to Matthew 24 and see what Jesus said about this thing? Huh? How about that? Okay, because he, he gives them an answer. Okay, but I want you to notice what shall be the sign of thy coming? What's the theme of the Bible? Huh? And when will be the end of the world? Hang on to that. What's the first thing I told you to hang on to? He departed from the temple. Second thing I want you to hang on to is, when shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Hang on to those three principles. I'm going to show you something or, or things. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, this is what's so awesome about this. We aren't in the book of Revelation yet, but we're going to be. Do you, want, do you even have any idea what Jesus does in this passage? When you get it, it's like, what in the world just happened? What he does right here in the rest of this passage is he literally lays out the complete order of the seven-year tribulation in its order. So you can't mess it up even if you wanted to. Just watch what he says. What he does is he parallels Revelation chapter 6 so perfectly, it's ridiculous. Does anybody remember what the first horse was? The white one? I believe I got it up here for you. The first seal. And, when I, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Do you know how many people that I've heard said that's Jesus Christ? <laughs> no. That's the Antichrist. The first seal. What, what did Jesus just say right here? Look. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. First seal, Antichrist. What's the next one? Watch. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, come and see. And there went on another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat there to take peace from the earth. And they should kill one another, and it was given unto him a great sword. When you take peace from the earth, and you're killing people, one another, what's happening? And what does, what does Jesus say? And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. What's the third seal? 
And when I opened up the third seal, I heard the third beast saying, Come and see, and behold, a low a black horse, and he that sat him, a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard the voice in the middle of the four beasts, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou not hurt the wine. Look what he says here. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence. What do you think is going to happen when the Antichrist starts to uh, pull money? Because you've got to take a mark. Y'all remember that, right? The mark of the beast. What do you think is going to happen? Huh? Nations are going to start rising against nations. There's going to be all kinds of war for food and things like that because it's going to be scarce. That's what's going on. What's the next one? It says here that and there will be pestilences and famines and earthquakes. What's the next seal? And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill the sword, and with hunger, and with death. And with the... Y'all see what's going on here? He's laying out. Jesus is giving you the book of Revelation in order. By the way, was Jesus doing it in order? So what we now learn is, is those first four seals, because he then says in the next verse, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So when will the four, first four seals be released? In the first half of the tribulation. Because if, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, we kind of looked and learned how the book of Revelation and Daniel breaks up the seven-year tribulation because something very specific happens in the middle of the tribulation. What happens in the middle of it? Oh, keep reading. Keep, oh, whoo. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated for... Okay, first of all, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the Jews in the tribulation. Anybody want to say he's talking to the church? Where? where? Can someone show me where? Because I don't see the church anywhere. And it becomes very clear here in a couple of verses. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Right around that middle point, guess who comes on the scene? The false prophet, interestingly enough, right? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax old, cold. Now let's put the verse in its context. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Where are we? We're in the tribulation. This is not to the church. Don't go to this verse to teach I can lose my salvation because it wasn't written to me. The church isn't even here. Now watch. And, oh, this is, a, this is one of the big, right, missionary verses. Come on. Y'all heard this, right? And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Big missionary verse. Here's the problem. Hold on, everything. The gospel of the kid. What kingdom? Okay, what kingdom is he not talking about? The kingdom of God. What kingdom is he talking about? The kingdom of heaven. I, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says, man. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what it says. Don't pull verses out of context. No, no, we can preach the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ unto all the world. And that's what we're doing, right? That's what they push. If we get it to everybody, then Jesus will come. Get it to, Jesus doesn't come because we preach the gospel of, of the kingdom of God to everybody. Jesus comes because the gospel of the kingdom was preached, and then they will come when the Jews call upon Jesus as their Messiah. That's when he'll come. I got all kinds of verses to show you that. See why this stuff's important? Is everybody with me right now? Now look at verse 15. When ye, therefore, shall see the abomination of desolation, oh boy, there, there's why knowing that Daniel passage becomes so important. Because who was that Daniel passage written to? But you know what people do? Somehow they make it about the church. What? No, it's to the Jew. And he says, right, as spoken by Daniel the prophet, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in flee into the mountains. Right? Okay, so what he now tells them is, uh, uh, and even, what does he say here? Let him be in the housetop, come down. 
anything out of this house, neither let him which is in the uh, field return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight not in the winter, neither on the... On the what day? Who would be still celebrating the Sabbath day in the tribulation? Oh, gosh. Man, this book almost is kind of cool, isn't it? Just read it in context. Okay, so my point that I'm trying to make is when do we know for sure when the abomination of desolation happens? It happens in the midst of the week, Daniel told us. So what we now learned is, is those four, first four seals are going to happen when? Y'all with me right now? You got it? That's when it's going to happen. And then what's going to happen is Satan, or the Antichrist, is going to go into the temple, the rebuilt temple. He's going to uh, uh, sacrifice probably a pig is what, what we're thinking right now, right? Well, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess that what it is. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation. Somebody's going to done kill the man, right? He's going to drop dead. While all that's happening, there's a great war going on in heaven between Michael and the archangel, right? M Michael says, hey, bro, you got to get up out of here. God says, yeah, I agree. Bye, because Michael can't do anything without God, right? Satan is then removed from the second heaven. He's cast down to the earth. He can no longer get back up there. All his angels come with him, a third of the angels, they were all in the second heaven, by the way, okay? They all come down to the earth, and then, boom, all hell's going to done break loose because Satan knows that his time is but short. And now he's going to go on an all-out mission to kill every Gentile on planet earth. Nope. To kill every church member on planet earth. Nope. Why is he going to go on an all-out mission to kill every Jew on the planet Earth? Let me tell you why. Because he knows that if the Jews as a nation call upon Jesus as Messiah, oh boy, heavens are going to open and here he comes. It's exactly what he tried to do in, before 1948 took place when they were getting ready to come back in the land. There's a reason why Hitler came on the scene and tried to kill all the Jews. It wasn't just because Jews were bad people. No, because Satan hates the Jews. He hates them because he knows what they do, what, what they're going to bring in. That's why. And he did, wasn't able to accomplish it back there. He got six million of them killed. Yet, here they are, still in the land. And they're sitting right there, but they're still in unbelief, my friends. That's what the tribulation is all about, is to convince the Jew that Jesus is Messiah. When he pleads with them face to face, you understand? Okay, and when they do, which they'll do at the end of the tribulation period, that's when the breaker will break and he will return. Okay, and he's going to come back to Edom. Why? Why is he going to come back to Edom? Because that's where they fled to in the wilderness. And that's where they are now in a place that we know today called Petra. That's where they're going to be. There's going to be a remnant of Jews that are going to be in this little place called Petra. It's all, there's all kinds of Bible verses to back up everything I just said. And when we go through the book of Revelation, I promise you we're going to go through them. I'm just telling you, this is what's going down. This is how this is happening. And it's so beautiful how this passage just breaks it all up for us. Look at those Jews are all going to start getting killed. Guess what comes on next? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of souls of them which were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And when it said unto them that they should rest for yet a little while unto the fellow servants. Oh, who's all, who are those people? Those were the Jews that Jesus was just talking about. They're going to get killed. Pretty cool, huh? In their order. Here we go. Okay, what's the next one? Right? The, 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 the three and a half years of the tribulation was the first three and a half years was called the beginning of sorrows. Then we have the abomination of desolation. All hell breaks loose. Jews are getting killed. The first five seals have now been released. Right? Seal number five, delivered, uh, the Jews are being de uh, delivered up to afflicted. They're, they're being killed. They're hated of all nations. The abomination is taking place. The rise of the false prophet takes place. Jesus all talked about that, right? In those, 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 those packed verse, those, uh, uh, verses there. Then what happens? And behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth untimely figs when she is a... a fig tree? Well, wait a minute. Hold everything here. 
Well, let's see what Jesus has to say here over here in chapter number 24. Let's look at verse number uh, uh, 24. For there shall arise Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they deceive the elect. Be, behold, I've told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert. Go, don't go over there. Behold, he's in the cha uh, uh, secret chamber. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the come, Son of Man come, uh, be. For whosoever the car wheresoever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Whoa, what happens up here? Oh, the sun gets darkened and the moon becomes black. There's blood. Y'all see this? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great trumpet and they shall gather together the elect from the... Y'all know what that is right there, right? That's a tribulation rapture. That's the gleanings. That's what's going on right there. Now learn a parable of the... Whoa, what does that say right there? And the stars of heaven under the earth, even as a fig tree, casteth her untimely figs we, when she is shaped. Y'all see what's going on here? What Jesus just basically did for us, he just laid out the book of Revelation for us. That's what he did in its order. So we can go, oh, okay, the first four seals happen in the first half. The fifth seal starts to take place right there in the second half when it's called the Great Tribulation, which, by the way, the first three and a half years is called the beginning of sorrows. The last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. I mean, I'm just going off of what Jesus said here and just telling you how this thing lays out because it lays out perfectly with Revelation chapter number six. Pretty cool, ain't it? Now, I say all that to say, okay, let's now take a step back for just a second and let's like take the bigger whole picture of the whole thing, okay? We got to understand what the abomination of desolation is and who it's for. Who's it to? You go back to Daniel 9, there's no question it's to the Jew. It flat out says it. So once you understand that, this is why comparing with Scripture is so important, okay? Then what we can do is we can come over to this passage and go, okay, so clearly, clearly, what happens is, is this takes place in that seven-year tribulation because when you understand Daniel 70 week, you understand that it stopped after 69 weeks when Jesus died on the cross. And we're waiting for the 70th week. Is everybody with me right now? I, I know it can be a little confusing. This is usually why I like to have a whiteboard behind me because it's easier to explain this. But it's all right here. Just read what it says and divide it right and we're good. Go to the different passages, find out what's going on, get them in their context. Do you see why I, I thought this passage was a great passage to go to? Because it is. It's a beautiful passage to teach what, I'm, what we're trying to say here. Because it's so obvious once you see it. By the way, while you're in Matthew 24, check it out. Look at this. Look at uh, verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be... Okay, what, what, what does that sound like? Two are in the field, one's taken, one's left. Sounds like a rapture, right? So what do you think people do when they try to teach that this is the church? You see, if you think this is the church that's going on up here in Matthew 24, guess what? There you go. See, the rapture doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation. I just proved it to you. The only thing you proved to me is you don't know what you're doing. That's what you proved. No, that is the gleanings rapture that takes place at the end of the tribulation period. See, now we got everything in context and we can put things in its proper order, and we can grab onto what's going on here. I want to close right here real quick. This won't take long, but I want you to see this because it's important. Luke 21. Luke 21, and we're done. Now listen, the reason why I want to show you this is because this is the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth, putting things in their context. Because if you don't, you will apply things wrongly. So many people... I would just say about just every commentary I've ever read, I'm pretty sure, pretty close, will say that what happened in Matthew uh, 24, what happens in Mark 13, and what happens in Luke 24, 1, they all call it the Olivet Discourse. Hey, he's talking about the same thing. And they try to bring it all together and mash it together. You see, the problem is that if you take Luke 21 and you mash it together with Matthew 24, you're mashing church doctrine with... Jew doctrine over here, that's a big no-no. This is why we're going to run into problems. 
Watch what's going on here. Remember those three things I told you? Make sure you remember. Watch. Look what happens here now. And he looked and saw the rich man casting gifts. So you, you, if you remember, they're in the temple right now, right? The rich man are casting gifts into the treasury, right? And he said, of truth, I say unto you that the poor widow hath cast more than all. For all these have of their abundance cast into the offerings of God. But she of her uh, 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 punering hath cast... Okay. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones, he said, as for these things, which you beheld these days will come, which they're... Uh, okay. Where is he still? See, Matthew told us that he left the temple and they went up into the Mount of Olives. But right here he says, he's still in the temple. And, and he looks out across and he says, hey, I just want you to know, He's not pointing to the temple for the time of Olives. He's in the temple going, you see all this? This is all coming down, my friends. You go, wait a minute. Contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction at all. Why was Matthew written? To show that Jesus was the king and it was written to the... See, so what Jesus is now doing... When he leaves the temple, he goes up on top of the Mount of Olives. They asked a very specific question. When's you're gonna, when are you going to come? When's the end of the world? And he gives them an answer based on the Jew in the tribulation. Well, hold on a minute now. Something different is going on here. Because watch. Look what he says here now. <clears throat> Verse 7. And they asked them, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what, shall be, and what sign shall there be that these things shall come to pass? Okay, what didn't he ask? What didn't they ask? When's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the world? Different questions going on here. By the way, different questions because they're in the temple still. They haven't left the temple yet. They didn't go up on the, uh, they didn't go up on the Mount of Olives yet. You all with me right now? And so he starts to lay some things out here. He says, take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my saying, saying, I'm Christ. But when you shall hear of wars, okay, and you start to look at this and you go, oh yeah, see, talking about the same thing. Hold on a second. What he does is he lays out those first four uh, seals, but then look what he does in verse number 12. Come on, read it. But before all these things, they... But for what things? It's what Jesus is about now to do because the book of Luke is written to who? He's talking to the Gentile church. Now, he's specifically in this passage talking to the Jew in relation to the Gentile church, but that's what, now we're talking to us. But before, before the tribulation, if you will, let me tell you what's going to happen, Jesus says. They shall lay their hands on you. They'll persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues, into the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Did that happen to all those apostles? Yes. When? In the tribulation or you with me right now? And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Listen, the whole reason why all of us are sitting right here is because of their testimony. Y'all got me right now? Right? Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which, you, uh, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist, and you shall be betrayed both by parents, brethren, and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Is that some of us? Have any of you ever written any of this stuff from your friends and family and stuff like that? Have you been hated for his name's sake? Wait, well, none of this was over there in Matthew 24. What's going on here? Because he wasn't, he's talking to somebody else now. You see, what I'm, see what's going on here? Listen, not a hair of your head shall perish in your patience, possess ye your souls. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of the depart out. And let not them that are in their countries enter therein. For these are the days of vengeance that are all things which are written may be filled. But woe unto them that are with child. Listen, he's talking about something different. Look at verse 24. And then shall they fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be dried down to the Gentile until the dying of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
So you understand what just happened there? See, over in Matthew 24, when he was up on that mountain, their question was, what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And so he laid out the whole tribulation for them. Over here in Luke 21, the question is, is when that temple going to get destroyed? And what he tells them was going to happen for the next 38 years to them, which, by the way, we got the book of Acts, we got all, all kinds of stuff that happened to them, we know. And then in 70 AD, what happened? The temple was destroyed, and the times of the Gentiles began, and we're still living in the time of the Gentiles right now until it be fulfilled. Don't, don't take these two passages and say they're talking about the same thing. They're not. They're talking about different time periods of things that are going to happen. One is talking about the Jew in the tribulation. The other is talking about the, the Jew during the transition. Right? It's exactly what's going on here. And let me show you how that is a proof text to it all. Check it out. And there shall be signs. Okay, then he starts talking about the second coming there. Now look at verse 27. Uh, no, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. As he spake to them on a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, you shall see of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Stop. Everybody look up at me. What is the point of all, uh, or the epicenter of all prophecy? It's Israel. When did Israel become the fig tree bloom again? Y'all, y'all. When you see that, look up. Time's coming. It's, it's getting close. Now, can we look at that and go, yeah, it is getting close. It, true. Watch. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. In other words, almost at its completion, it's nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be suffered, fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now watch 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and care. Wow, I think Paul talked about that over there in Romans 13, didn't he? Didn't he? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Huh? And so that day come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch now verse 36. Which ye, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all the things just to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What rapture are you talking about right there? That's the church rapture. See, you're going to escape all those things. That's not going to happen to you. The, the things that are going to happen in the tribulation that he's getting ready to talk about with them when he goes up on the mountain with them in a second, that ain't going to happen to you if you escape it. Now watch verse 27. And in the day he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And there you go. Where did he teach Luke 21? In the temple. Where did he teach Matthew 24? What is the point of the book of Luke? It's pointing to the Gentile. It's giving us Gentile information, stuff that's going to go on around the Gentiles. That's why he's, Jesus is focusing on, hey, the time of the Gentiles is going to start when this temple gets destroyed. Okay, there's the message. And when you see the fig tree return again, no, summer's not, get ready. Count yourself worthy to escape all the things that are coming. Okay, now that we've talked all about that, let's go up on the mountain here. I got something else I want to talk to you about. And he brings him up on the mountain. And he tells the Jews what's going to happen to them during the tribulation. Okay, listen. I get it. I know it's 1232 and I know we all want to go home. But I don't want you to miss the point, okay? There is so much doctrine and theology wrapped up into those two chapters. And if you get them wrong, then you understand why we get so much false teaching going on in the church. You get them right, Jesus laid it all out for us perfectly. That you, you can't get it wrong. Just... What did he say? Watch. By the way, one last thing. He taught the book, uh, Revelation chapter 6, in order. Which means what? If you know anything about the book of Revelation, what does that mean? Because then he then goes on to teach us about the seven trumpets, and then he goes on to teach us about the seven 
False, right? What, what does it mean? If Jesus taught chapter 6 as start of tribulation to end of tribulation, what does it mean about the other seven trumpets and seven... Anybody? It's not in order. You see, everyone teaches the book of Revelation as if it's in order. No, it's not. It's not in order. Each one of those, the seven seals is the start of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. The trumpets, start of the tribulation, end of tribulation. The vow judgments actually start in the middle of the tribulation to the end of tribulation because that's when God pours his wrath out. When you understand that, now you know how to take and divide Revelation properly, which so many people divide it improperly. I know I'm taking long to do this, but this stuff's critical. This stuff's critical. Number one, it's critical that we understand. And I know I gave you a lot of information. I get it, but it's recorded. Go back and listen. You can email me. I'll send you PowerPoints. I'll answer your questions if you have them. This stuff's important. It really is. Because you are going to have people out there who are going to ask you questions. But you know what? As important as that is, and you want to be able to always be ready to have an answer, okay, you need to know yourself so that you're not deceived by stuff. Amen? Okay. Whew. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. We just want to thank you for your word. Lord, I'm so grateful for your word. Lord, I, I know that uh, there's a lot of information being poured out, especially these last couple of weeks, Lord. Uh, I just pray that, uh, uh, number one, we would get the heart behind it, uh, what it is that... Uh, uh, as the pastor of this church, I feel it's important that we hear, knowing that we have it recorded so we can go back and listen and slow things down so we can take things in uh, a little slower if we need to. Uh, but, but Lord, I just pray that everybody knows this stuff is vitally important. We've got to get it right. Uh, we got to rightly divide the word. We got to know the theme of the book. We got to put things in their proper context. Because if we take even a little bit and do not do that, we can run ourselves into false doctrine and a little leaven, hmm, it will run. And we don't want that to be allowed in our Bible learning. Uh, we certainly don't want that to be allowed uh, from the pulpit in our Bible teaching. Uh, so Lord, uh, I know it's a lot, uh, but I pray that if we are serious about this, if we really true, truly desire the key of David, we'd go back, we would listen to these messages again, knowing that everything's recorded, knowing that PowerPoints are available, and just go slowly through these things till we get them. And Lord, uh, I pray that everybody in this room knows that I love them enough that if they have questions, they want to talk about something, I am more than willing to sit down and have a conversation with them to help them uh, if they're having trouble seeing something. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful for you, uh, grateful for, for, for the blood. Uh, Lord, because without the blood, we would be headed to a devil's hell. Uh, Lord, thank you for who you are. Uh, thank you for, for dying on the cross for us, Lord. Uh, thank you that by your grace uh, and your mercy, uh, we could be saved. Uh, so, Lord, uh, we, we just love you. Lord, uh, I hope that everybody in this room desires to have that key of David, to be a man after God's own heart. Uh, Lord, you raised your word above your very name. Obviously, you're serious about it. May we get serious about it if we're not. And if we are, may we continue to be diligent. Uh, Lord, I pray that we have a good day. I pray that you would give us all a good week, uh, that we, we would minister to the people that need to be ministered to. We'd speak to those that, are, uh, that don't know you, Lord, uh, that we would put it in our hearts right now that we're going to speak to at least two or three people this week about you. Uh, Lord, and may that be a testimony to uh, our love for you uh, and what you did for us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, amen. Love you all.